if you haven't read her memoir, The 13th Gift, um, I want to just put in a plug for it. It's, it's just really touching and um, a delightful story. And I know that she's going to be talking a little bit about it during her presentation. Joanne Hust Smith worked as a reporter for the Dayton Daily News for 17 years, writing stories about events that shaped the greater Dayton community. In 2009, she received an Ohio Associated Press Award for Best Community Service for a package of stories on heroin's destructive path through neighborhoods. Smith retired from the newspaper in 2012 after signing a book deal with Harmony Books, an imprint of Penguin Random House, to write the New York Times bestselling memoir, The 13th Gift. She currently teaches journalism and creative writing at Dayton Stiver School for the Arts. So please help me welcome Joanne Smith. And I'm going to pass it over to you. Hi, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for giving up your Saturday. I think that there, though we are in a time of, of great uh, upheaval in our country, it's the perfect time to be a writer. There are so many things happening, uh, the elections, the pandemic, that are just fodder for our imaginations when it comes to memoir. So this, and plus, you know, when we have to stay home, it's good to make that time productive so writing is perfect. So this is our time, guys. So first of all, I just want to give you an overview. And by the way, my middle name, my mom pronounced it Hewist, and my dad pronounced it Hughes. The story there, you would think my dad knew how to pronounce his own name, but that didn't happen. Okay. Uh, first of all, overview. Each of us carries a lifetime of memories, experiences buried under layers of life. Writing memoir brings those hidden gems to life. A memoir may mark a, a grand adventure or showcase a quiet life lesson learned. You don't have to be famous to write memoir. You just have to have lived. Writing personal stories enable the author to truthfully ex examine their experiences and give meaning to the events. So we don't only write memoir for other people, we write them for ourselves. Uh, as I wrote The 13th Gift, I learned so much about my motivation at the time that I, I, I truly didn't understand. Memoir may be as, an enlighten, as enlightening to the writer as it is to the reader. So get ready to unleash your own sleeping dragons. A memoir may represent a, a single moment in your life or a whole series of adventures. The topic does not have to define the scope. Only the writer can do that. The genre takes many forms. It could be a poem, an essay, a magazine article, an anecdote, a podcast, a short story, or a book. It seems that, that um, as we move into the age of technology, there are more and more opportunities for people who, are, who write memoir. And all the podcasts that we are hearing now, uh, you know, that's a great form. Uh, and a single idea can morph into lots of different forms. Uh, if any of you from, are familiar with uh, John Grogan's writing in his book, Marley and Me, started out as newspaper columns, morphed into a nonfiction book, became a movie and then became movies for children. So he, a single idea about a man and the love of his dog turned into all those different things. There's an art to unearthing the perfect story ideas, ones that resonate with the human condition. These stories grab our attention on the first line and hold us captive until the end. It's a skill set that absolutely can be learned. Detail rich stories bring the past to life. Doesn't matter if the writer has a less than perfect memory, because believe me, I do not. There are ways to peel back those layers and let in the light, and I'll share some tips with you to help you do that. To begin, all writers really need is the courage to start, and that's a biggie. Uh, just by definition, memoir is a record of events written by a person having an intimate knowledge of them based on personal experience. Now, when I first started writing The 13th Gift, and I always intended it to be a memoir, I, uh, I wrote it from this perspective, not only myself, but my children. And when I, I 
did get an agent, she looked at him and said, you can't do that. You can't be in somebody else's head if you're writing memoir. You can only be inside your own head. You can say what you think they were thinking, but you can't definitively you know, say what someone else has on their mind because memoir is about you. It's, it's about what's in your head. Introduction. Memoir tells the individual story of the author, the good, the bad, the beautiful, and the wicked. Uh, it may represent a moment in life or decades. These personal accounts may celebrate momentous occasions or unadorned life-changing events. We are not all heroes. We haven't all faced down villains. Don't, don't lose heart if you have not. Quiet stories can carry the same emotional weight for a reader as an act of heroism if they're told with passion and with heart. For example, uh, and, and I will mention this essay several times during this presentation because it, it is one that I absolutely love. I've included a copy of it in the package that you, you'll be getting. And because it, 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 it so depicts writing about a quiet life. And that is uh, the, mess, the, the essay, Once More to the Lake, written by E.B. White, was first published in 1941 when E.B. White was 15 years old. He wrote a short pamphlet about a lake his family visited. When he was 15 years old, he wrote a short, or rather uh, in 1941, he wrote a story to his brother Stanley about the same lake. And then uh, years later, he visited the lake again with his own son, Joel. And that published version um, inspired from that very first visit. In this piece, there are no fireworks. There's no romance. Uh, there's no action adventure. It's an essay about white struggles with the themes of aging and death and the passage of time, emotions we all experience. And again, I've included a copy of it. Uh, it takes guts to write memoir. Memoir falls under the genre of nonfiction. So first and foremost, you, you can't make it up. It has to be true. Uh, memoirs relive the life events they write about every time they place their fingers on the keyboard or pick up a pen. Still, the difficult cat task of recounting a story, if that's not enough. As I wrote The 13th Gift, it sometimes felt as if I were peeling back layers of protective skin that had grown over time and distance. It hurt, but the triumph of my family over grief, just, it wouldn't have been the same without writing about that struggle. So you have to add perspective. That's what makes a memoir different from, let's say a, a diary or a journal entry. You have to look back at what happened, say what you've learned. It's not enough to say what happened. What did it mean to you? How did it change you? Why was it significant? That's all part of the memoir. Now, I, I'm going to now break a little bit to give you a writing prompt. And don't worry, nobody has to read theirs out loud. Uh, but I'm going to read you mine. And I'm going to read mine before just to give you an idea of what I have in mind. This is an exercise that I do with every memoir writing class that I have taught. It's one that I learned a lot by writing about. What we're going to do is to write a short essay entitled, Why I Write. And I'm going to give, I'm going to read mine and then I'll give you a few minutes to get started on yours. Why I Write. I write to silence ghosts. I write to banished voices whose love words encourage me to be timid, to hide my dreams under scratchy blankets. I write for the father who told me little girls from Dayton don't grow up to be writers. I write to prove him wrong. I write to prove myself right. I write for two sisters who brought me pencils and ink pens and a, and a Delta 88 broom trunk load full of pink legal pads to write on. I write for those same sisters who accepted no excuses when I shilly shallied about putting said pens to paper. I write for the man who believed in my art 
who gave me a typewriter with a broken key and a space to scribble out of the earshot of our children, even though he wanted nothing more for me to, than for me to be happy as a wife and a mother. A righteous shortened the distance since he went home, a time longer now than he made me feel alive. I write so there is a record of his life demonstrating he was the elusive just man Plato sought in his Socratic dialogue. I write to forget him, to move on, love again if possible. I write for myself. I write in the hush of the night when the house snores and white noise wakes me. I write to avoid snacking at midnight. I write to solve problems and create others. I write to honor the authors who instilled in me a love of words and rhyme and the rhythm of a story well told. I write to quell the voices in my head that won't shut up until I bring them to life. I write the two truth to remind humanity what it sounds like. I write of fear that in the chaos I will forget. So that's why I write. Now I, I want to hear or I want you to write about why you write. Why are you compelled to pick up pen and paper? Uh, so if everybody's ready, I just want to take maybe five to ten minutes and let you get some ideas down. You're not going to get to 250 words in this amount of time. But I want you to get started. And more than anything, I want you to be honest. Be genuine. Even if it's ugly and if it hurts, include it. Okay, go ahead. And uh, I'm going to watch the clock and give you about five to seven minutes. Okay, put your pens down. Now, um, I'm hoping or that uh, in this writing, if you were really sincere, you're probably feeling a little bit vulnerable right now, um, perhaps a little bit emotional. I, I know that in the course of writing mine, I went from you know, sad about my dad and how he told me little girls from Dayton didn't grow up to be writers though I think in the end, that's probably what motivated me most to become one. Uh, I celebrated with my, that my sisters who are both past now, and how much they encouraged me to be a writer because I knew that was what was in my heart. Uh, and you know, it, it, it reminded me of my husband. So I went through a whole gambit of emotions. If you wrote, and you did not feel any emotional connection to what you were writing, go back and write it again. Because with memoir, that is vital. Okay, we're going to move on to selecting a memoir topic, which is probably one of the most challenging and critical steps in, in the process. If you live in small town Ohio, drive a beat up shabby like I did, and spend weekends at home binge watching Netflix, it may be difficult to imagine a book-worthy story kicking around in your sleep-deprived brain. At least I did. Uh, I wanted to write the great American novel, complete with spies, hot cars, and romance. But my only knowledge of any of those things were from books. I was lucky. I had been journaling daily since second grade. My journaling actually started with a book a lot of you may be familiar with, it was Harriet the Spy. If you're younger than you might remember the movie, uh, in that book, the author, uh, the story was about a little girl who wrote down everything. That's what I did. I started after I read the book, I used to spy on my sisters. Uh, they didn't like me much, uh, I, but I wrote down everything I saw. And as I grew older, I wrote, everything I felt. Uh, I wanted to, I, I was, I, I grabbed a handful of my, I grab a handful of my finished journals every year. I have probably several hundred of them. I mean, I'm 66 years old. I started writing in elementary school. So every New Year's, I pick out a random sampling, maybe of two or three. And I go back and I read stories from my journal, things that I wrote, what I was experiencing at the time. And that's exactly how I found 
the, the idea for the 13th gift. I had been reading through my journals and I came across the one that chronicled the story of the death of my husband. There were things I had written at that time that I didn't even remember. This was 10 years after the fact. Things that had happened, just for an example, uh, after my husband passed, the doctors asked if we wanted to take our three children back to say goodbye to their dad. And I didn't really want to do that, but you know, my youngest, my my youngest and oldest, believe it or not, both wanted to go. So I took my eldest first, Ben. He was 17 at the time. And he um, all he could do was cry when we went back there. He was afraid to touch his, his dad's body. And so I, I took him out and told the younger two, you're not going. But but Megan, you know, the, the baby of the family at age 10 said, I'm going back, mom. And we went back there and her dad was, his body was still on the, the, the table in the emergency room. And she, she started with his face and she just touched every part of him. And I asked her, Megan, what are you doing? She says, I'm remembering. That was hard for me to hear. I went back, I told Nick, then 12, you know, you don't have to go back there, but because his little sister had gone, he was determined to go too. And the first thing Nick did was go back and put his hand on his dad's chest. It was still warm because of the overhead lights. Nick thought if he was still warm, he had to be alive. So he started screaming for doctors. Uh, the doctor had to come in and, and, and reinforce to Nick that, that his dad was gone. Now, I didn't even remember that 10 years later. If I hadn't put it in my journal, I would never have remembered. So what I am encouraging you to do now, start today if you want to write memoir, keep a journal. Because our memory phase, a journal will not find it, right? Put them in a safe spot. I keep mine and you know, the big zip bags that you, that um, sheets and blankets come in. I probably have five or six of those filled with journals. They're safe. They're, you know, protected from the weather or the water. Uh, and then I, I go back periodically, pull one out and look at them. Okay, uh, the importance of theme in memoir. Some of you might already have an event in mind you, you wanna write about for your topic. If so, what is the theme? What message are you trying to convey? What the heck is the point of what you want to write? Look for universal themes ones that reflect the human experience that others will be able to identify with, things that will resonate with everyone. Fear of death, joy of a new love, overcoming an obstacle, wanting something or someone so badly, you're willing to do anything to attain it. In other words, life, loss, privation, challenge, coming of age and aging, to name just a few. Remember, your theme is not a synopsis. You should be able to convey your theme in a single sentence. Writing exercise. We're gonna do another quick one. Before you sit down to write your memoir, write one sentence describing your theme. For example, the 13th gift is a story of how a family emotionally frozen after loss come to experience joy again. Now, I won't want each of you, I'm only gonna give you a minute, just real quick. If you have a story idea in mind, I want you to write one sentence about the thing. Go ahead.
Okay. That should have been really hard. It is really hard to take a huge idea and boil it down to this tiny little sentence. But you need to understand what you're writing about before you write it. You have to know what the point of the piece is. What's the underlying emotion? All right. Um, where do stories come from? When I write memoir, I start by asking myself questions. And I've included a, a long list. These are questions I have developed over the years for myself that I will share with you. Uh, and, and when we're done, I, I would like you to either pick one of these and uh, just, just kick some ideas around about it. See how it feels, like try it on for size or come up with a question of your own that you can write about. For example, name a smell that reminds you of the holidays and write about it. I have included uh, a story that, that um, Elizabeth will be sending out to you called Rolling, which was actually what I call a, a memoir recipe. It is uh, something that I gave as gifts one year for Christmas to friends. I wrote the story of how I learned to make cabbage rolls. I am of, of Polish uh, ancestry on my mother's side. And it was traditional that we got together before weddings. And we would make hundreds, <laughs> hundreds of cabbage rolls. And this rolling story is how I learned to do that. The very first time I went to this gathering of women in my family and we all learned to make the cabbage rolls as, my, as a gift. And here's a Christmas idea for you. If you have a friends that you'd like to uh, get something unique, I wrote the memoir, I included the recipe, and then I made the recipe to present to my friends. So uh, that's a way to take memoir and turn it into a gift for family and friends. All right, now I want to go over some of my other questions. Um, what was the single happiest moment of your life? This is not as easy as it sounds. It is much easier to, to define the worst moment. You know, when I, I uh, told my daughter that this was one of the questions I asked myself, and she said, okay, who's your favorite kid? This is the happiest moment. It must have been the birth of one of them. Was it me? Was it my brothers? It's hard to define the single happiest moment of your life, but it can be very rewarding uh, as a memoir. Uh, what were you up to on the dirtiest roll in the mud, covered in gold metal flowers, skunk smelling nasty day of your life? I won't tell you what I was doing, but that, that's a fun one. Who is your best friend and how did he or she earn the title? What does the word sadness remind you of? Who influenced your opinion of religion, politics, or social justice? Traits of your parents that you inherited. A moment of beauty that took your breath away. Was it physical, spiritual, intellectual, all three? Was your mom a good cook or a disaster in the kitchen? My mom only cooked on holidays. My dad did all the cooking during the week. Uh, what did your father smell like? Mine worked at a uh, lithographic printing company. So he always had the smell of ink on his fingers. Uh, relate a laundry, gardening, or house story experience. I shared a laundry room memory in the 13th grip. It was the most dramatic scene of the book, and it was the hardest to write. Uh, the scene opened with me finding a note written by my deceased husband in the pocket of his jeans. Uh, did you have any pets as a child? This one brought back lots of memories for me, and every single one of them was sad, believe it or not. Uh, my first pet, a dog, I only had for one day. I was eight years old. My parents wouldn't let me keep it. What is your earliest memory? I remember getting C's on my first report card. Dad told me he was very disappointed in me. Broke my heart all the way through college. I never, ever got another C. Always be above. 
So select one of these topics or develop a list of your own. Write a story in 10 minutes or less. Don't worry about the grammar, the sentence structure, imagery, or story flow. Just write. Be sure to include how you felt about the incident. What impact did it have on your life? If you like what you've written, you can expand upon it later. Go ahead, take a few minutes and write. You can start with your own question or use one of mine. One more minute. Okay, and if you're thinking that wasn't near enough time, that's a good thing. That means you have something to go back to and write when we're done. All right, here's two uh, additional sources that you might want to explore if you like the whole idea of the story question, or at least one of them is geared toward that. It's a book by Julia Cameron. It's never too late to begin again. In there, she lists her own set of story questions. Um, you know, if you like this exercise, by all means, make up your own list. I always do whatever I can never not to know what to write. I never want to, you know, waste time where the, the wheels in my head are spinning and spinning and spinning. I always have, as a matter of fact, I keep 
a separate small notebook that is nothing but story ideas. And I, I write them down. And when I'm stuck, when I don't know what to write, I go pick one of those. I like to take the guesswork out of it. The other thing is that, is, you know, I'm a former journalist. And um, when I was a little girl, my father used to require that I read the newspaper. And, you know, I'm talking maybe 11, 12 years old. And I didn't just read one article. He made me read the entire paper. And then he would quiz me about one story in that entire newspaper. And I had to be able to tell him about it. And if I couldn't answer his question, I had to write the whole article out by hand. Now, back in the day, newspapers, one, were much thicker. They were, the stories were much longer. So I did not want to be writing those. So I, I, I uh, tried to read every word. And what that did is instilled in me a love of stories. And now when I'm looking for story ideas, one of the first places I turn, especially for memoir, is the newspaper. As I said, as we started this presentation, we are living through so much right now that is fodder for writing memoir, uh, the pandemic, and our experiences through that, the, the experience of isolation, being socially isolated, uh, the past election and the chaos of that. These are all things that we can write about. This is such a historic time that I think that by writing about it, we really do a service to future generations to, to let them know what it was like during this, this unusual and unique time period of our history. Okay, now, so you have an idea of what you want to write about. How do you narrow it down to make it um, you know, coherent? Uh, there's a great scene in the movie, A River Runs Through It, uh, that mimics the, a rule of thumb I use uh, to narrow the scope of a piece. In the scene, a father instructs his son to write an essay. The son goes off and completes the assignment. The father reads it and says, make it half as long, cut it in half. The son goes back, does it again, presents it to his dad. Father again says, cut it in half. When you sit down to create a list of memoir topics, jot down the big moments, then break them down into small, manageable beats. It is in those beats that we find our true stories. Now, memoir can be a, a one-liner, uh, baby shoes for sale, never used, uh, famous one-line memoir. Uh, Actually, that may not be a memoir, it might be fiction. Um, you can write it as an anecdote. You can write a poem. You can write a short story, an essay, or a book. They come in, memoir comes in all shapes and sizes. Length may vary from a single sentence to a series of books. The topic will dictate your scope. Uh, words of advice start small. The 13th gift started as a short story morphed into a, a magazine-sized article. And when Penguin Random House finally published it, it was a full-length book. Each time I finished a version, the short story, the article length, uh, the book, the first thing I did was present it to my writer's group. They uh, critiqued it. And each time they did, they said they wanted more. That's how I knew my story was actually going to be a book and not a short story. I can't stress enough the importance of finding your writing tribe, even if your group can only meet on Zoom. Uh, our stories are like our babies. We think each one perfect, but chances are they're probably not. I know mine aren't. Uh, my writer's group is always my first audience. They are gentle, but savvy enough to offer criticism that helps even if it hurts a little. You know, one of the, the most challenging things if you are a writer is to find that writer's group that you click with. Um, I found mine at, um, at a writer's workshop. And then I ended up working with several of the ladies uh, at the Dayton Daily News. So 
find other writers. Writers need writers. We need that fidelity. Uh, I always write, here's a writing tip. I always write a minimum of three versions of everything I write, every sentence, every paragraph, every scene or essay. The three versions make my first draft. So three different versions just to get the first draft done. So this is what I do. I begin with the bare bones, beginning, middle, ending, focusing on moving the plot forward and developing the theme. I'm not worried at this point about the language, about the point of view. Uh, that'll come later. During the second go round, I fill in story holes, story gaps, what's missing. Have I created a confusing storyline? Read your piece out loud and ask yourself, am I giving the reader enough information to move on to the next scene? Or have I given them too much? My third run through, remember, we're still on the first draft. It's all about adding color and making a flat piece sing. I make it three dimensional, give your story life, bring your setting alive with personality just as you would a character. Once again, go back, read the E.B. White story. In the E.B. White uh, piece, you will see that the lake is so vivid that it actually becomes a living, breathing character in the piece. Now, once you've written a, 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 your third version of your first draft, close your eyes. What do you smell, hear, taste from your piece? If you answer, if your answer is nothing, you gotta go back to the keyboard. By the time I get to that third version of my first draft, my piece should be as alive as, as you and I are sitting here. Uh, so how do you write memoir if you have a rotten memory? Um, when I decided I wanted to write about the weeks following my husband Rick's death, I had to develop memory jogging technique. It was a slow process, but the kids and I created the book together, one memory at a time. I am that woman that who goes to the grocery store to buy a single ingredient, spends a hundred dollars and comes home without it. I may have visited a friend's house two dozen times, but still need to ask for directions. And if you expect to receive a card from me on your birthday, better send me a yearly reminder. I am not a doctor, a psychologist. I, I have not studied the brain. I don't even know how memory works and wouldn't likely remember if I weren't. So here are some tools I use to help me prepare to write about an event that happened more than a decade earlier. Again, I'm going to go back to journal Journal like you want to remember. I have surrendered my heart, screamed my frustrations, and chronicled my joy in the pages of my journal since I was in fourth grade. These bound volumes are my confidants and they have unfailing memories. If I try a new hairstyle or hair color, I record it there. Stubs from movies or concerts, I, I keep them there. Uh, business cards, when I meet someone new and interesting, I ask for two copies. One I put in my card file, the other I put in my journal. Uh, I also put newspaper clippings in my journal and date them. Uh, mementos, um, such as postcards. It, my journal start, might start out about that thick, but by the time I'm done, it's you know doubled in size. I like to use just regular notebooks so that I can add uh, ones that I can add pages to so it can be as long as I want. Uh, so if you write memoir or hope to start, start journaling. 15 minutes a day will be worth the time spent. Remember, journaling, I, I, I know so many people who say, I, I just can't journal. I, I don't have the discipline. I can't do it. But if you're going to write memoir, it's a good way to develop your writing muscles. And I really believe that learning to be a writer is like learning to be a bodybuilder. The more you work at it, 
the stronger you get, the easier it becomes. When I first started writing the 13th gift, which was, it was a struggle. I, would, I had no idea what I was doing. And I didn't have the discipline to sit down and make myself write every day. Now, I know that there have been lots of books written about um, setting, making dates to write. You really have to do that if you want to, to be a professional writer. If you're doing it for fun, then maybe you don't have to do that. I, it, it meant too much to me. I mean, writing is it's not just what I do, but it's part of who I am. And I know that I am happiest when I am writing. I mean, even my, my children are all adults now, but uh, my daughter can always tell if I've been away from the keyboard too long because I get crabby. So if you're like me, one easy way to keep your, your hand in the game is by journaling. Uh, organize family and school photos and videos. Uh, how tall was my daughter Megan in 1999 when my husband, husband passed away? I, I couldn't tell you. But I had videos, home videos, that my husband himself had shot, and I was able to look at them, and I could guess or estimate. Uh, did we still have that hideous green couch that Christmas my husband passed away, or had I replaced it? I found pictures of it. I knew we still had it. Uh, I found the answers to all these questions and many more by organizing family photos chronologically. And in my case, since my story involved my children, I organized them also by child. With the photos before me, I was able to write detailed pro profiles for each of my characters in the book, including myself. I had to get to know these people again as they were that Christmas. And honestly, there is no better way to do it than to look back at our videos and photographs. Now, you know, I, I, I'm assuming that all of you are um, library enthusiasts since, you know, write library go. Uh, you're you're uh, taking this uh, course via a library, but while most people turn to the internet when they're looking for information, don't forget your local history rooms at your neighborhood library. There you'll find newspaper archives and historical documents rich with information about everything from the weather to the crime reports. <coughs> Excuse me. If your memory is vague, First, start off, write what you remember. To make the task less daunting, break it down again into small beats. For example, each of my children developed unique coping skills to deal with the loss of their father. Megan played sports. Nick uh, always had his nose in a computer. And Ben, he turned away from me and, and his siblings and turned to his friends. Each of these coping skills became a beat that I wrote about, and then I set them aside. When I finally started writing the actual book, I had 50 to 60 beats already written that I dropped right into the story. Uh, for example, I was able to write a description of myself. That way, when I got to the point where I, I, I needed that kind of information, I already had it written. And beats are very simple to write. Beats as I define them in terms of memoir are just little pieces of memory that we can expand upon. And uh, I believe, I really believe the actual, actual um, process of writing helps to jog our memory. So often people will tell me, I can't remember that. I don't know, I don't know. But when you start asking them questions, one memory will lead to another that will lead to another. We can do that with ourselves. Don't let yourself say, I can't remember. Uh, now, give it a try. Cast aside all your negative thoughts about poor memory and just write. I mean, honestly, if I can do it, you can do it. And here's something else I think is important. When people are writing memoir, they think, this is my story, I'm gonna write it. Well, other people live those memories with you. And what really helps give your story depth is to interview those other people. 
uh, in my book, one person that I, I had to interview was my sister-in-law who played a very big role in helping the kids and I get through that Christmas. I wrote my story first and then I went to her and said, how do you remember it? Now, I don't put her thoughts in my head when I write, but I do say Charlotte said this or Charlotte said that or Charlotte would later tell me, you know, those are all tricks that you can use. The, the 13th gift is really a combination of uh, the memories, the collective memories of all of my children. Megan, she still lived at home with me when I wrote it, so I had easy access to her. Nick, I had to promise him food in order to get him to rehash these difficult memories, chicken wings. Chicken wings and Nick was talking, talking, talking. Uh, so again, you have, don't think that writing memoir just involves you. Go out, interview other people. And in, uh, in my story, I had, um, I, I had uh, several scenes where I went to stores. I went back to stores, asked them if I could talk to employees who were there at the time, all of them obliged. And I was able to just make sure I, I, I knew that, um, like what uniforms the people might have worn at the time, uh, that, that all helped. The other thing is you can also uh, use, use historical records. Like it would have been really easy for me to just write that um, Ohio is gray in winter. Now it is, look outside. But when I wrote the memoir, I actually used historical data from the Dayton Daily News and from the National Weather Service so that I could pinpoint the exact weather on the days that I was writing about. Uh, so here's a writing tip. The memoir writer takes advantage of many of the tools that fiction writers and its fiction writers tool belt. Theme, plot, characterization. If you master the art of fiction writing, then crafting memoir will be much easier. Now, if you think that writing memoir is just sitting down and writing what happened, no, that's not it. You have to you know, develop the plot, figure out the theme, as we said earlier. You know, you have to have characters who are vivid and alive and your setting should be like another character in the book. So master those traits and you can write fiction or memoir or fiction. Okay, another writing tip, write memoir as if it were a scene in a movie. Make it three-dimensional. Remember action and conflict advance the plot just as it does in fiction, not exposition and background. This is something that I do with every piece that I write. I go through and I highlight all the pieces in my story that are exposition or that give background. Now you have to make sure that those, those two things do not overpower the sentences that show action. It should be the other way around. Writer's block. Anybody ever had writer's block? I don't believe in it. Some writers need all elements of a story plotted out before they sit down at the keyboard. So if you can't figure out all the plot points, that's an excuse never to get started. Don't do that to yourself. Even when I think I know exactly where my characters are taking me, they often go somewhere else. Even in writing memoir, what surprises me in memoir is to learn how I feel about what people are doing. The cast aside any thoughts of writer's block. That's a phenomenon I refuse to let enter my workspace. I believe in full speed ahead, no matter what. If I get stuck, I know it's because I have not done my homework, my research. Just because memories live through an event doesn't mean they are off the hook when it comes to gathering background. 
when you do get stuck, don't stop writing. Instead, write a vivid outdoor scene or develop a character sketch. What did your main character look like at the time the story was set? What clothing was, was popular at the time? Was the person a trendsetter or a conservative? Write until you remember. Write until you have enough to set the scene. If you're not absolutely certain about a fact you, that, that you really want to use, Tell your reader, tell them, this is what I think happened, or this is how I perceived it to be. Be honest, no matter what. Uh, again, this is often when, I, when I, I am really stuck, it's when I go back to my journals and reread them, or I interview others with knowledge of the story. Uh, it's something you might need to do anyway. And you can always write about how you felt about the event, but never take your fingers off the keyboard. You know, one thing that um, I always do uh, when I'm writing, I never stop a piece at the end of a scene or a beat. I always stop in the middle. I always stop when I'm in the flow and I know what's going to happen next. That way, when I come back to my keyboard, I can just pick up. What I do is just write a little note. This is what's happening next in the scene. So then I just sit down. There's no writer block there because I know exactly where I'm going. Don't, I mean, if you're dog tired and you're at the end of the chapter, don't let yourself stop. Keep going, keep going. It will be so much easier the next day. Uh, writing tip, ask a friend to read your piece out loud to you. Are the punchlines funny? Does the writing flow? I often skim when I read my own work and sometimes what I say out loud is not what I have written down on the paper. My students do this all the time. They might've had an idea in their head but didn't execute it onto the paper or it, an earlier version had it. Hearing your own work read by others, seeing how they react to the punctuation, to the line structure, may point out flaws that can easily be fixed. Now, uh, another thing I, I wanna talk about, especially people who write memoir often start lots and lots of pieces. I do something that I personally call write track. And, but it's R-I-T-E track. And what I do is I catalog my stories. I, I catalog them in two different ways. That way, if I'm in the middle of a piece and I, I stop and I don't get back to it for six months, I'm not lost about one, what the file name is, what the, what, where I was heading with the piece because I have it all written down. I tend to use Excel a lot. But I also, you know, I write fiction, nonfiction, poetry, and essays. I also write news. Um, so when I start a piece, I open, I have an Excel file that has every single story I have ever written on it, every single poem I've ever started. Uh, and I, I just, I, I name my file, and I give it a name that will jog my memory about uh, what, what it's about. And then I list the date that I worked on the piece and uh, the genre, you know, just indicate M for memoir, P for poetry, and then writes one sentence, one line about the story. You can list them in alphabetical order. You can list them by date. I cross-reference them. <laughs> I mean, I, I, um, I did this out of necessity because I had so many pieces um, uh, you know, for example, when I, I right now I'm, I'm writing a novel and each time I write, a piece changes, especially when I'm in the editing phase. So I have a list under the story name with what I called it and, and each new file as I revise. So everything about one story will be in one place every file, every date, every, every synopsis. 
this really helps. You know, if you're a real organized person, maybe you might not need this. I do. I did. And it, it took me a month to set this up going back. I have writing dating back to my grade school days. Now I, I know exactly where to find it on my computer. I have it uh, both alphabetically and by chronological order, and I can look it up either way. Uh, okay. Well, uh, our, my presentation also includes, you know, lists of nonfiction books. Uh, many of them are bestsellers. Uh, if you have not read them, I can not strongly enough recommend that if you want to write memoir, you need to read memoir. That you need to know what's out there. You might have a great idea and write a, spend a year on a book only to find out someone else has already, you know, wrote it and released it before you got finished. So read, read, read. See what's in the marketplace. That will help. Now, I guess I, I want to open up to questions or if, any, if we have any interest in publication. Um, Joanne, I just want to break in here. Thank you so much. Um, I really think you gave a lot of great information today. I do have a question from the chat. Um, people to ask their questions in the Q&A or chat. Um, also, before I launch into that, I want to just remind everybody that I have two wonderful mugs. It actually says just write the next sentence and has a typewriter. Um, and I have these to give away. I think actually the best way to do this is um, you do have to live close enough to pick it up from the library. We will do curbside delivery if you don't want to come into the library. But if you could just, if you'd like to be um, put in the drawing for these um, mugs, just put um, a note in the chat, um, raffle. And I have everybody's email addresses. Um, I'll go ahead and raffle those off and um, let uh, contact you by email to let you know who won. And Joanne, um, the first question we have was about writing about other people. And if there are any laws or, or maybe ethics about, you know, maybe what you say about other people or how to include other people in your memoir. Uh, you know, I um, am working on a piece that is, uh, so actually I'm working on it with a mother of a child who was murdered and, at, at age eight. And we are writing a lot about other people that were involved in um, what happened. And what I do, yeah, there are laws. You cannot you know, defame people. Uh, is that I will go to the people and tell them, I will ask them their version of the story and I will tell them what we were writing and see how that jives. I get their permission to use it. Now, if you want to write a piece that, um, you know, let's say is very negative about someone, then I would consult an attorney. I would not just write it. But what, what I have done, I mean, there, there were some difficult interviews that I did um, with this mother. Uh, you know, I, I interviewed the, the mother of the, uh, the young boy who's accused of her murder. And, you know, I got her permission. I told her what I was doing. I got it in writing. That way, the writer is protected. And I, I have heard that some writers will change names. Does that, do you know? If, if, you you're, writing, that? if you're writing nonfiction, tell the truth. Okay. You know, if you get to the point where, uh, you, if you have a, a, an agent or an editor, which is very, you know, if, for nonfiction, it's at the, the kind of the beginning of the process. For fiction, it's at the end. I would consult them. I personally would not do it. You know, if you're going to write memoir, you're writing nonfiction, tell the truth. Okay. Um, another question, I'm going to let you answer this and then I'll um, add my two cents. That is, What's the best way to find a writer's group in Dayton? Uh, the library? <laughs> no, I, I, um, I think one of the, the best ways is to go to, work, go to workshops. 
And uh, whenever there's an opportunity to, um, like this, to converse with writers, I, I don't know if you're sharing emails or if that's a taboo. I know that I found my writers group at the Antioch Writers Workshop, and we've been together for decades. Uh, I think that um, there, that we're really blessed in the Miami Valley to have an amazing sodality of writers. You mentioned Sharon Short uh, earlier. You probably know Katrina Kittle. Um, there are so many. Uh, go to their workshops, uh, network. I know it's really hard right now. I mean, I, I never was successful in, in um, like going to a, a internet site and finding people. I, it was always the, the personal connection because I think finding a writer's group is like trying clothes on for size. Not everybody's going to work. Mm -hmm. And, and it's, 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 it's almost like, this is a weird analogy, but it's like, you have to be comfortable with going in a room naked because these people are, they are taking your child, your writing, and you have to trust them to critique it. You got to make sure you don't find people who are in it for themselves and who want to denigrate your writing to make themselves feel better. I mean, it's, it's very tricky. I don't know if that helps at all. It's, it's hard. Go ahead. I'm anxious, I'm anxious yeah. to see what you have to say. Well, well, I was going to just reiterate. I mean, so a workshop like this, unfortunately, it is online right now. But typically, this is the kind of workshop we have in person. And a lot of times I have seen at the library, we've done these workshops for, you know, years. Um, uh, although the, the writing series is just a couple years old. But um, that's a great place if you go to a workshop and you, you, you meet people there and you talk to people and, and um, a lot of times people can say, hey, let's get together and um, share our writing. So uh, I think it is especially hard right now when um, we can't get together in person. Um, there are a couple of Facebook groups for Dayton writers. Um, one is for NaNoWriMo, which um, probably a lot of you are familiar with, but it's National Novel Writing Month. Um, of course, that's fiction. That's kind of aimed at fiction. But, you know, you could, you could write your memoir. And a lot of those folks, um, there's a Nano, Nano Dayton Facebook page. You can, I'm sure, search for it. Uh, they actually meet up. Um, they may be doing virtual meetings right now. And um, they just get together, like at a coffee shop, and all write together. And uh, so that's a good group. And there, I know, I think there's one, a Facebook group called Dayton Area Writers, but um, now is probably not the best time to find a writer's group, but I mean, this can't last forever. So um, look online on Facebook and, and look for when we can get back in person too. You know, writers are unique characters in that, uh, I don't know about any of you, but I love to talk about writing. And so one thing that I have done, and I've, I've, I've actually met some very good writing buddies this way, is I tell people I'm a writer. And, you know, if they say I'm a writer too, that's, you know, you start the conversation. I, I do not hide the fact that I'm a writer. You know, I let that light, which I'm proud of, shine. Uh, because to me, there is nothing better than a conversation with someone who knows the struggle. And, you know, I found even with my students at Stivers, you know, I, I um, largely teach seniors. So I'm, you know, not at school right now because of COVID. Uh, but it doesn't matter your age. It doesn't matter the level of your experience. If it's in you, the connections are there. You know, the, the one thing that was great about the Antioch Writers Workshop, God rest its soul, uh, was that you could be sitting next to somebody who had 10 books, on, you know, in the bookstore. And, you know, I'd be sitting there, but, you know, I didn't have one at all until a few years ago. But it didn't matter because writing, writing connected us. 
So don't be afraid to tell people that you're writing and you'll know right away if, if something they're not into. I think that's the only way right now to really make that bond. Um, I wonder, we, we just have a few minutes left. Um, sorry, I posted something in the chat that <laughs> is the wrong thing. Uh, Sherry Young shared the Facebook page from Nana Rynamo and I, I'm gonna, um, maybe she can share that again for all attendees. I'll try to put that in too. Um, but Joanne, just in the last few minutes, do you wanna maybe talk about the publication um, a little bit? Right now, publication for the um, unknown author and I, I was an unknown from the Midwest. That that's like two whammies against you. It's it is a challenge to get published because right now, what's hot in memoir are political books, firsthand experience political books. Um, that doesn't mean to say that if you have a good story to tell, you can't you can't sell it. Uh, I met my agent which used to in, in in memoir or any kind of nonfiction book, you just you don't write the whole book. You write a proposal. So I um, met my agent at a workshop. I had uh, I gave her a presentation, which was only three minutes. So you have to be able to sum up your book and sell it in three minutes. That's not a lot of time. Uh, she asked me to send her pages which I did. And a couple of days later, she asked me to send her chapters. So when you write a memoir, if you're writing a book, uh, write chapters, at least three, to use with your, send with your proposal. They cannot be the first three chapters. That would be easy if you could write the first three chapters. But you have to write something from the beginning, show the transition, and show the ending. And so I actually wrote my book out of sequence. Uh, with memoir, I think that's a little bit easier than it would be with fiction. If you're writing fiction, you have to complete the whole book. They do not buy on spec. So for nonfiction, they'll buy on spec. For fiction, no. First step, if you want to go to a major publisher, you have to have an agent. The, the big, you know, random house, um, Harper Collins, they won't look at you without an, without an agent. You send work to them, it's going to end up in the slush pile and you know, you'd be better used just recycling the paper. Uh, there are a lot of smaller publications, a lot of um, literary magazines. Look at colleges. One of the, the very first story I ever published, which was kind of a surreal memoir, I published in the Wright State Literary Magazine. Most colleges have them. Uh, a great resource is the Write, Writer's Digest Market Guide. Uh, look for uh, a place that, that fits. Locally, um, we have several um, magazines, uh, but they're all in the Writer's Digest Market, market Guide. So I, I would look there first. You know, if you're just starting out, write for you. 